Welcome to Nani Notes. Well, here we're going to explore the mid-segment theorem. We're going to have a lot of fun with this. It's going to involve measuring. Yes, you need a ruler, and you're going to need a protractor. No compass, though. It's not a construction. So we're starting with this big triangle. It takes up your whole sheet. You either drew some random triangle like this one, or you, um, you got the one I handed out to you. Either way, let's get measuring. So take my ruler and um, I got, well, mine is a simulated ruler. It's looking like, what is that? 68, so 34, halfway. Just measuring like that. That's all you got to do. And you're going to find midpoints like that. How hard is that? Not at all, you say. And then you're going to measure this one, BC. And what are you going to get there? Oh, I don't know. You can do the same thing. Measure that midpoint. And now you've got these two. We'll call them D and E, respectively. Now, if you label them the same as mine, then at least well, the instructions will be easier. So um, we've got two midpoints. And when we connect them right there, we are drawing a mid-segment. Hey, I forgot to mention, for those of you that like to fold your paper, just fold it. Put the C on top of the B. Hold it up to the light. Give it a crease. You'll crease right on the D. Save you a little effort. You know, then you don't have to measure. We'll give that a try, if you like. So, here we go. Uh, let's get back to it. I'll put my segment back in there. And see. Yeah, that's my mid-segment. So, DE is a mid-segment of this triangle ABC. Now, our mid-segment theorem tells us that it's parallel to and exactly one half the length of the segment CA. But you know, I want to experience that. I don't want to just believe some theorem. This isn't really a proof, but this is, well, let's, let's explore this, let's say. Let's take our protractor. And we're going to measure some angles. Now you could put the vertex like that. And of course, you all know we could we could use the other scale. We could read it that way. We'd be using the outer scale. I like to hold it this way, and I'll be using the inner scale. And I'm looking at those numbers, and I'm reading. 60, 70. Yeah, I'm getting, on my simulated instrument, about 72 degrees to the nearest whole degree. Then I'm going to pick up my instrument. And I'm going to measure this angle, and this angle that I will call B, D, E. See, and I can see again, I've got my 72 degrees. So let's take this and put that up there. Very nice. Now, I've got those two angles, and that's going to tell us something. tells us that I've got parallel lines. Because again, this is the transversal. BC is a transversal. And notice again, I write it as lines. DE may be a segment, but it's a segment contained in the line DE. So let's be formal about it. And CA likewise. So those two lines containing those two segments are therefore parallel. And that's a little demonstration. It's kind of fun. So, um, now, let's see. Where, where have we gone next? Oh, yeah, next thing we're going to do, we're going to find another midpoint. Measure this sucker up right there. And let's measure it and then divide by 2. And that's going to give us our last midpoint. Or we fold our paper. And we've got our midpoint F. And therefore... CF congruent to AF. So we've got all these different sets of tick marks to show that we have all these uh, all these midpoints. And now we're going to draw in the other two mid-segments. Now, I know what you think you see. So let's see if you really see it. We've got, what else we got there? Uh, well, we're going to measure another angle. I'm going to measure this angle, AFE. I'm going to measure this angle right over here. And 
you would probably say, say, aha, uh -huh, that looks familiar. I've got this angle measure again. I've got my 72 degrees. Now, of course, if you drew your own triangle, you probably have a different measure, but that's okay. So now, what have we got? We've got three angles there that are all the same. So I'm just going to replace, I'll, I'll get the angle measurements out of there. That's not that important, but I've got these three angles are all congruent. All three of those angles have the same measure. But now, watch what we've got here. These two angles gave me DE parallel to CA. However, these two angles, angle C and angle EFA, well, that's going to connect these two lines with the transversal AC. Or another way of saying it, let's just say EF is now parallel to BC. Notice I have to put in a, a different type of tick mark, just like on congruence. I'm going to go with a double arrow on this one just to show that those two are parallel. Differentiate from the other parallel marks. So I've got three congruent angles. I've got three pairs of congruent sides. And I've got two pairs of parallel sides. Let's keep going with this. And um, well, I think what we're going to have to do is measure something else. Let's move up here and measure angle B. Now, when I measure angle B, a little bit less, that's 60. I'm going to go down another degree, and it looks like I'm getting 59 degrees for angle B. Move my instrument down here, and I'm going to measure CDF and confirm again that I get my 59 degrees. So now I've got another pair of congruent angles. And wait, I know those two, I measure those two to be the same, but I also have these two are congruent. We've already established this pair of parallel lines, so angle B and angle FEA must also be congruent. That's going to be um, corresponding angles postulate. We've been using the converse before that. Wow, it's looking pretty good. So the three blue angles are congruent. I'll clean this up a little bit, move the numbers away. The three blue angles are congruent. The three red angles are congruent. Let's add something else to the mix. Look at angle B. Look at this angle, CDF, and your transversal right now, BC. Well, that's going to give us, yes, our third pair of parallel sides. Pretty exciting. We've got three pairs of parallel sides. We've got, let me see, we've got... Uh, three pairs of congruent sides. Well, we've got a lot of stuff going on here. We've got, let me see, we've got three of those blue angles, three of the green angles. We could use the third angle theorem and establish another three angles that are congruent. Not necessary. We're just going to, we're just going to stop there and move in another direction right now. And that direction is right here. I want you to look at the triangles that we've got. Now, if I look at this, these two triangles, that is the kind of the pink one and the blue one, DBE and CDF, well, they are going to be congruent. I've got the blue angle, this side, the red angle, congruent to the blue angle, this side, and the red angle. These two triangles are going to be congruent by angle side angle. Now over here, the pinkish one and the green one, 
a little bit different. Red angle, blue angle, BE. Congruent to red angle, blue angle, EA. That's going to be a case for angle side angle. Oops. <laughs> All right, apologies. Angle, angle, side, I meant. That's something funny. So, okay. Again, these two, angle, side, angle. These two, angle, angle, side. Regardless what we've got right here, we are going to have three congruent triangles right now. Look at this. You can have a lot of fun with this diagram. You've got, again, C, D, um, B, Okay, DBE congruent to CDF congruent to FEA. Make sure we got those in the right order. That looks good. I think that's good. Now, um, I'm going to clean up some of this writing over here for a little bit because I want to make another point. Let's get this out of the way, get this out of the way, and maybe um, move my mid segment theorem. Let's just look at the diagram. There's a fourth triangle we could see. And it's this one right here. Now, by corresponding parts of congruent triangles, all these different sides are congruent. So DE is congruent to CF is congruent to FA. By corresponding parts of congruent triangles, EF is congruent to BD is congruent to DC. Therefore, therefore, I've got a fourth congruent triangle, which is a 180 degree rotation. It's a 180 degree rotation of the other ones. That's kind of cool. So now, this is, well, let's go back to, let's put our theorem back up there. Because our theorem, remember what we were trying to demonstrate. We can see that DE is parallel to CA. But now we can see where the one half comes in. If all these triangles are congruent and DE is congruent to CF, and AF, that means DE is exactly one half of CA. Or I could say CA is twice DE. Pretty interesting. So, well, I hope you uh, got to enjoy all that. And um, we're going to you know, put keep that in your notes. And now we're just going to have a look at another drawing you can do in your spare time. It makes me, when I look at all this, when I look at these mid-segments all drawn together, can't help but think of our good friend, the Sierpinski's Triangle. Now, you can do the same thing you did before. I want you to measure the midpoints. Go ahead and take your ruler, measure the midpoints. And this time, when you connect them, I want you to connect them like this. Meaning, draw the three mid-segments, but only shade the fourth triangle, the one that we had rotated 180 degrees. Now, this activity is really going to be helpful in our, in our chapter on similarity. And this will be your first exposure to a fractal. But let's just have a look at this. Let's have some fun, because we can see a connection to the mid-segment. Then I want you to look at this, at this triangle, this one in the lower left, the one in the, in the top, and the one in the lower right. We've got three unshaded triangles. We're going to repeat the process. I want you to find the midpoint of this three sides, and it's going to look like this. How about here? Now, it's, it might take a bit of paper folding if you're trying to find midpoints that way. 
measuring, and it could be a little tedious as well, because the fact is we've always done this assignment as a computer assignment, and that's really where it belongs. So if you have access to the program Geometer Sketchpad, you can teach yourself to construct this in no time, and it's a lot of fun. And if you don't, well, um, I guess next time, next time you're in my class, or the next time we're actually back in the school, ask me how to do this, I'll show you. It'll be a blast. So there you go, Sierpinski's Triangle. A little bit of a diversion for us, a beautiful fractal. Now, turn your paper over, let's get to the last page. Oh. All right, I decided to give us a, a, a little activity where you get to review some, well, some equations, just practice. Now, this is all middle school stuff, so, and we're going to review it, and I gave you all easy whole number or integer answers, so you could just read them off the graph, but let's work them out. Let's go through the midpoint formula in blue. The average of the x's, average of the y's. Let's find the midpoint of, um, let's find this point u. So that's the midpoint of PR. I'll call this one x1, y1, this point x2, y2. If I want to find the coordinates there, 0 for x1 plus 4 for x2 divided by 2. 2 plus negative 2 over 2. Just that easy. And of course when I add them together, 0 and 4 makes 4. 2 and negative 2 makes 0. I can work that out. That looks like it, the coordinates are going to be 2, 0. And I'll put that on my graph as well. Easy. Not much to it. Clear this out of the way. Now, I know you could have looked at that intuitively and said, well, what's in the middle at 0 and 4? Well, that would be 2. That works. That works, and it's good to understand your formulas. And um, I just want to give you an opportunity to practice them as well. If I'm looking at the midpoint of RQ, now I personally like to have the point farthest to the right to be the x2, y2. It doesn't have to be. That's just the way I like it. And I do that so that slopes will always have a positive denominator. It's just my little thing. You guys do what's comfortable for you. So 4 plus 6 over 2. Well, that's easy. 4 plus 6 is 10. Negative 2 plus 4 is 2. Work that out. I'm going to have 5, 1. Now, Honestly, I wouldn't really use this formula in this application. Um, but like a, when you're learning how to use your tools, practice with the formula where the answers are obvious. Then you know that you're working the formula correctly. And it's no different than a carpenter who, who measures a known length to see that he's using the instrument correctly. So here we go. We'll put 5-1 in there. I mean, cause of course, I could just ask you to say, what's in the middle of 4 and 6? Well, that would be 5, 4, 5, 6. And that's what a midpoint is. It's the middle. It's the middle value if you have two values. Now, I'm only going to do a couple of these for you. I'll do two slopes and two distance. So the slope, now that whole rise over run thing. Let's find the slope of PQ. So again, I'm going to take x1, y1 here. Slope y2, 4, minus y1, 2, over 6, minus 0. Well, 4 minus 2 is going to give me the number 3. And 6 minus 0 is, of course, 6. Can we simplify that? Yeah, of course we can. And we're going to turn that 
Did I do something wrong? Yeah, I did. <laughs> Wait, four minus, four minus, sorry about that. Four minus two is two. And uh, six minus zero is six. Well, that looks, that's, that's gonna look a lot better. So of course we could take that and we could simplify that. We can divide out the factor of two and we will have one third. So there you go. Maybe I can put that right on top of there. There you go. PQ has a slope of one third. Now, how about the slope of UT? You know, we could even draw, we could even draw UT. How about if we draw that? Because that's really a mid-segment and that's what we're figuring out. We're going to find its slope. Y2, that's one minus zero, Y1 over x2, five minus x1, two. And this one doesn't need to be simplified. One minus zero is of course one. Five minus two is three. And in a more direct way, we get this right there. In the case of non-vertical lines, lines that are parallel have the same slope. Conversely, if lines have the same slope, they are parallel. We had that in section 3.5. Remember that? Okay, I'm going to move this out of the way. So we need to make some space. So that's a demonstration that they're parallel. You know, and I, I know you all could have, and some of you love to do this instead. Where's my, uh, I mean, we've always done up, you know, up to over six. So you could have done rise run like that. I'm okay with that. That's the same thing. Well, let's look at distance formula now. One last set of calculations. I'm gonna do the distance formula. I'm gonna do PQ. Now the distance formula says, I'm gonna take the difference of the X's. That's X2 minus X1, six minus zero and square it. I'm going to add to it the difference of the y squared, 4 minus 2, and that quantity squared. And then I'm going to take the square root of all of that. So that's my direct substitution. I can simplify this because that's going to be the whole number 6. This is going to be the number 2. 6 squared, 36. 2 squared, 4. Can we add that together? Oh yeah. And I'm just going to add it up and I'm going to get the square root of 40. Hmm. Well, that's not that exciting, but hang on to that thought. So PQ is radical 40. And hang on to that thought because we're going to work out one more. That's the length of the segment PQ. Let's find the length of UT. And again, this is my X1, Y1. This is my X2, Y2. The difference of the X's, five minus two, that quantity squared. One minus zero, that quantity squared. Five minus two is of course three. Replace that with three. One minus zero is a one. Now, you see where this is going. That's going to give us nine plus one under the radicand, or as the radicand. Nine plus one, 10. So UT has a value of radical 10. Now, before you go reaching for your calculator and telling me what radical 10 is, I don't care. That's not the moral of the story here. We're just trying to make a demonstration. And this is how you're gonna do it. You're gonna look at your radical 40 that you got over here. And you're gonna say, yeah, something funny about that. 
and say, uh, I remember something about simplified radical form. So we're going to simplify the radical. Think of two, well, think of two whole numbers whose product is 40. Hey, two and 20. <laughs> True, but useless. Better? Four and 10. Why is that better? Because, of course, four is a perfect square. And that's the largest perfect square that fits in there. So when I take that, when I take that perfect square, I take the square root of four, I get the whole number two. And now I've got something useful. I've got two radical 10. Let's compare the two now. Put that over there. Right now I've got PQ is two radical 10. So what have we done? Wow, all this arithmetic. We found parallel lines having the same slope and we found two segments. PQ is exactly twice as long as UT or UT is exactly one half of PQ and that that is your mid-segment formula. Now, it's your turn, and you get to work out. I want to see the, um, the numbers for these four slopes and these four distances. Yeah, I guess you'll need to find the coordinates of S. Not too hard, but let's get the work done. So get it all done. Send it in for credit. And um, uh, if you're in my class, well, thanks for following. Well, if you're not in my class, Thank you for watching, and hey, thank everybody. Thank you for watching Nani Notes.